Karen is an assistant professor in the Department of Geology and in the Renew program, and I have to look up the research and education in energy, environment, and water uh, at, the uh, at the University of Buffalo. Um, and she comes from there. She's really actually a rocket scientist in training. People don't know. Uh, NASA um, and the Goddard Space Center um, does a lot of work on planet Earth, and they had a mission to planet Earth. And are you part of the mission to planet Earth, or no? You all are. We are all part of the mission. Um, but she did her postdoctoral work at Goddard um, and has worked on ice sheets in the Antarctic, uh, in, I'm going to get it, the Olympic Peninsula, Mount Rainier, uh, and most importantly for tonight's talk, uh, in Greenland. Uh, she is a wonderful speaker and expert in a, in a field that is, pardon me, fast evolving. Um, and it is a pleasure to have her here even if the message is one that will hopefully scare the wits out of you and get you to go and talk to all your friends about cutting your carbon footprint. Uh, so please help me in welcoming Karen Poinar to the Cary Institute. <laughs> Thanks. All right. Thanks, Josh. Um, I'm really happy to be here. Um, my name is Kristen Poinar, um, and I just joined the faculty at the University of Buffalo. Um, I'm in the uh, Department of Earth Sciences, um, where we have a strong, small, and growing uh, climate science research program. Um, there's four of us faculty members who study um, the Arctic, paleoclimate, um, and particularly for me, um, the paleoclimate and current climate uh, of the Greenland ice sheet. Um, so I just moved to New York State, um, so I'm really happy to be seeing a new part of New York State um, where it apparently is still snowing. <laughs> um, so yeah, I want to talk to you about my research program um, in Greenland. Um, and as a glaciologist, I motivate my work by sea level rise. Um, so yeah, Josh in, in the introduction um, talked about what might happen to Manhattan in the coming years as the climate changes and seas rise. Um, I like to think about what's going to happen before Manhattan itself is underwater every day. Um, and this is storm surges. Um, so in the current climate, uh, we have, say, 2010, um, the high tide level for this coastal area is uh, safely below the house. Um, but when there's a storm or a hurricane that occurs, um, this storm surge comes and floods this person's basement. Uh, and that's a problem, maybe a nuisance. Um, but as, as, sea levels be, as sea levels start to rise under climate change, and you have the same storm come and, come and happen, but you start with a higher high tide base, um, that same storm causes a lot more damage to these coastal homes. Um, and if you run this forward in time to uh, 20, uh, 2100, when sea levels are projected to rise um, about a meter or maybe more, um, then this house is totally in a lot of trouble. Um, and the same storm surge that was just causing a minor problem before is starting to wreak havoc on this coastal city. So storm surges, big coming problem for, uh, under climate change with sea levels, uh, with rising sea levels. Um, another problem um, is going to be salt water intruding in our drinking water. Um, so um, some of our drinking water comes from wells, wells that tap into the fresh groundwater system. Um, and in coastal areas, in some cases, these well bottoms are close to the groundwater that's affected by the sea, um, this saline groundwater that's here to the right. Um, of course, as seas rise, and uh, the saline groundwater is going to creep in with the rising sea, and so these wells are going to start to sample salt water as well as fresh water, affecting our water supplies. This is going to be a problem for coastal communities. Um, not all of us live exactly on the coast, and not all of us are going to have to deal with these exact problems. But we are all linked to the coasts by our trade-dependent our trade dependent economy. Um, so almost no matter where you live in the United States, or the world, truly, um, all of our goods um, uh, in this, uh, in this, um, in this eco economic network um, all of our trade is anchored at the coasts by these large port cities. Um, so as sea levels rise and start to have these, and we start to have these problems with storm surges and everything um, on the coasts, that's going to affect the ports, and we're all downstream of ports. Um, so even those of us who live in the middle of the country, um, 
and we, uh, even those of us who live in the middle of the country, uh, are still concerned about sea level rise. Um, so three good reasons um, why studying sea level rise and trying to understand what are the current rates that sea levels are rising and how can we expect those to change or accelerate in the future, um, I've given you. Um, so what are the sources of sea level rise? Um, they're threefold. Um, first, as the climate warms, the water in the oceans also gets warmer and it expands. Substances expand when they get warm and they take up more, more, uh, more space. So seas are rising because uh, they're warming. Um, Josh also mentioned um, glaciers around the world are melting. Uh, glaciers in alpine environments um, are melting and going directly into the ocean. Um, third, we have these ice sheets, Greenland and, Ar and Antarctica. Um, and these are currently the third largest contributors to global sea level, but these ice sheets hold by far the most ice um, in the global climate system, um, a total of 70 meters between Greenland and Antarctica. Um, so as these ice sheets start to melt and start to accelerate, um, the, their contributions to sea level are becoming more and more important. Um, so let's go to Greenland. Um, let's start in western Greenland. Um, there we go. Um, western Greenland um, is the warmer side of the continent, uh, the island. Um, so you see all of these freshwater, meltwater lakes um, that are speckling the entire west coast of Greenland. You can zoom in here um, and see all of these features uh, that are occurring as meltwater, um, as, as the surface of the ice sheet melts. Um, Greenland isn't flat. Um, it's got rumpled topography, um, a lot like the topography around here. And so water, uh, water flows into lows and collects in these superglacial lakes that we see. And these lakes are, are connected together um, by rivers. Um, these rivers, uh, um, the, the, the rivers and lakes together form this beautiful uh, network of water that flows along the coast of, of the ice sheet, or flows along the surface of the ice sheet. Um, so, um, and the water just flows in response to gravity. It's, act, it's, it's really pretty simple. Um, just the way that we have lakes and streams around here, um, these same features occur on the ice sheet surface. Um, so uh, we have this video from the field um, from the group at UCLA um, that shows um, the water up close. You can also study the water um, at a larger scale by looking at satellite images. Um, so this Landsat 8 image um, shows really the extent um, of how long these lakes and streams are, the extent of this uh, network of surface water that's flowing all over the Greenland ice sheet. Um, so generally, uh, this is uh, water starts at higher elevations um, and flows through this dendritic network down to lower elevations. Um, so we have small streams that are tributaries to larger streams, um, and some of these stop at lakes along the way. Um, it's almost kind of like a, uh, it's a lot like a chain of alpine lakes uh, where you have water cascading from one lake basin down to the next, down to the next, down to the next. Um, this surface hydrologic water network um, is a pretty efficient way um, for the ice, uh, for the meltwater that comes off the ice sheet to be removed quickly to the ocean. Um, so this is Western Greenland. Um, sometimes the, sometimes the, the rivers um, are torrential and erode these strange features in the ice. Um, and you can see some of the junctions here that we saw in that, in that satellite image before um, where smaller streams come together uh, to, flow, to flow together to make bigger streams. Um, some areas of the ice sheet um, are less steep in topography, and so the water there is flowing less, fat, uh, less, less quickly. Um, and so these are kind of like swamps um, on the terrestrial Earth. Um, uh, the sediment in these areas falls out, so it's not being whisked along into the ocean. Um, in the slower moving water here, um, there's a chance um, for all of the sediments that are present um, to pool up and collect. Um, the substance is called cryokinite, um, and it's a mixture of uh, soot, windblown dust, volcanic ash, basically anything that can get picked up into the atmosphere and be deposited onto the Greenland ice sheet, um, you'll find in these big swampy pools. Um, you can see the cryokinite, the dust, um, is much darker than the bright white ice that's surrounding it. And since it's darker, um, it absorbs more sunlight, gets hotter, um, and melts down. 
So it's sitting in the bottom of a pool of water that it itself has melted. Um, it, so as a thought experiment, um, say you have a, a small disk of cryokonite material um, and you have this disk under the hot, well, it's not hot, it's just the, the Greenland sun in summer never sets, right? It just goes around and around and around it, um, east, west, north, south, east, west, north, south. Um, but the sun is always at a very low angle. So the, although it's always out, it never gets very high in the sky. So the, these, sol these solar rays are coming in at a steep angle. Um, it hits the, the dark cryokonite dust, melts it down, um, and forms, you get these, these strange cans, these, these cylinders of water that, um, where the dust has uh, melted its way down. Um, and then more, more, sun more sunlight hits the dust and it melts farther down. But there's a limit to it because the sun is so at such a steep angle in the sky. Um, once the dust has melted down to a certain depth, which is uh, four to six inches in my experience, it stops because it can't see the sun anymore. Um, it's now it's now insulated from from any of the sunlight that's coming in, so it simply stops there. So you get these these fields of these cryokonite holes that are that are just a couple of inches deep. Um, and they're reliably always at the same depth. Um, so it's pretty neat, it's a pretty strange phenomenon. Um, these holes are calm areas without very much water flow. Um, all the water that's being generated is just being done so very passively as, as the dust melts down slowly. And these dust, uh, these cryokonite dusts contain minerals um, from the volcanic ash and the windblown dust and soot. Um, and so they're great habitats um, for tiny ecosystems, um, microbes, algaes, rotifers, tardigrades, uh, just live in these, live out their lives in these tiny cups. These are the highest life forms that exist on the Greenland ice sheet, are these microscopic animals. That's the top of the food chain, tardigrades. Um, <laughs> so when you go to the field, um, there are no polar bears, and you do not have to worry about a polar bear ever coming up onto the ice sheet because there's simply nothing for them to eat. Um, so when people go to, uh, you know, northern Alaska to do field work, they have to bring someone who's trained with rifles and they have to be armed at any time um, simply to be safe from polar bears. We don't have to worry about this here. Um, the tardigrades are not out to get us. <laughs> so I want to show you um, a video of one of these cryokonite holes. Um, let me see if I can animate it. So you can see the ice sheet is outgassing here into this crack and ice hole. There's these little blurbs of, of air bubbles coming up. The air in these bubbles is 70,000 years old. The air in these bubbles um, has traveled through the entire ice sheet um, and has re-emerged here at our feet. Um, I want to illustrate to you exactly how this happens. This is the anatomy of how an ice sheet works. Um, every, every winter, Snow falls at the top of any ice sheet, Greenland ice sheet, um, and then and then more snow falls on top of it, and more snow falls on top of that, um, and the um, the weight builds up, um, and the air that was contained within the within the tiny grains of snow um, gets compacted together as the snow is compressed into ice. The air can't escape, um, so it just as the weight of the snow gets more and more and more over tens of thousands of years, these air uh, these um, molecules of air get trapped in the ice crystal that forms um, as the snow travels down to the deep to the belly of the ice sheet. Since there's more snow falling on top of Greenland year after year after year after year, it piles up um, and the ice deforms under its own weight and gets pushed out to the sides. Um, so over tens of thousands of years, um, our original snow and ice parcel is going to travel across um, through the, uh, through the interior of the ice sheet until it emerges out here um, in western Greenland where all the melt is happening. Um, and since the surface of the, of the surface of the ice sheet here is melting, um, this causes these particle paths um, to emerge at the surface here. And that's what you see in this video, is that air that's been, uh, that's been on its journey through the ice sheet re-emerging and bubbling up. So the ice flows and deforms under its own gravity. 
Um, and we can use a series, um, we, can, we can measure this by satellite. Um, so we have, um, by working over uh, many years and many observations from uh, Japanese, Canadian, and German satellites, uh, we can track exactly how and where the ice is flowing. All of this is gravity-driven flow. Every single uh, particle path that you see here um, is occurring because ice is deforming under its own weight as snow falls and falls and falls. So you can see, just as the river network on top of the Greenland ice sheet was self-organizing itself um, into tributaries that go into larger streams that go into these big rivers, so too does the ice itself. Um, there's this emergent flow pattern where the ice itself is moving and organizing itself into fast-moving tributaries, which we call outlet glaciers. So by this point, I have given you the three key ingredients to how an ice sheet works. Um, the Greenland ice sheet is a device uh, that connects climate changes to sea level. Um, so uh, the, first piece of the first ingredient to an ice sheet is snow. Um, every, every year it snows on the middle of Greenland and that snow piles up. Um, if that were the end of it, then Greenland would get bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger every year um, and it would expand into the stratosphere and obviously that doesn't happen. Um, so how does the ice sheet get rid of all that snow that piles up? Um, uh, the ice flows into the ocean um, and the ice melts. Um, so a healthy ice sheet, an ice sheet that is in mass balance, has these uh, three things happening roughly um, equally. Uh, for, every, for every kilogram of snow that falls on the ice sheet, approximately a kilogram will flow out um, and or melt. Um, my question um, that my research program is based around is can the meltwater uh, actually interact to speed up or slow down ice flow? Um, so that do these two things that, uh, do these two ways that the ice sheet loses mass interact together in a complex way? Of course the answer is yes, they do, but how? <laughs> um, so let's return to these beautiful rivers um, in, in Western Greenland. Here's a person for scale. So you can see um, this particular river is, is pretty large. It's, it's not quite the Hudson River, but it's bigger than your backyard stream. It's a river, not a creek. Um, and these rivers, uh, the flow rate through them has only been increasing um, in recent decades. Um, Greenland is warming up. And an interesting um, additional line of evidence for the uh, additional warming that's happening in Greenland um, is the fate of sled dogs in western Greenland. Um, so I, I, I visited the tourist museum um, in Alulasat, Greenland, um, right here. Um, and I learned that uh, the local communities have long depended on sled dogs for wintertime travel. Um, so there's all these communities um, up and down the western coast of Greenland. Um, and you can imagine it might be, it's, it's very difficult to, um, to travel by land or by air, especially in winter when it's, when it's dark, completely dark in Greenland. Um, so sled dog is the preferred uh, mode to travel from village to village on the sea ice, um, on the frozen ocean that occurs in the winter. In the summer, you can take the same paths, you just use your fishing boat. Um, but um, as the sea ice uh, is forming later and later each winter and melting earlier and earlier each spring, um, and in some winters it's not even forming thickly enough that it's safe to go out with your sled dog team, um, the sled dogs in western Greenland um, are becoming unemployed. Um, so, <laughs> this is western Greenland. Warm, melty, happy place for dogs. Um, but I also want to introduce you to eastern Greenland. Um, so just as the western coast of North America is different from the eastern coast of North America, uh, the, cal the climate of California is much different than the climate we have here in New York. Um, so too is the case for Greenland. Um, here is uh, a map of the winds around Greenland uh, yesterday. Um, so faster winds are in blue, slower winds are in gray. I mean, you can see the, the rough direction of the winds um, and the rough magnitude by the length of the arrows. Um, so you can see um, this, uh, this storm uh, this, this phenomenon of the uh, Icelandic low pressure zone um, centered around Iceland. Um, and the Icelandic low means that it makes storms like this that swirl up, uh, that evaporate North Atlantic ocean water and dump them as snowstorms onto East Greenland. 
um, East Greenland sled dogs are doing just fine. Life is proceeding almost as normal in East Greenland. Um, and you can notice from this picture, um, the landscape in East Greenland looks completely different. Oh my gosh, I didn't mean for that to make noise. <laughs> um, the landscape in East Greenland is completely different. Um, there's, there's all sorts of snow. Um, winter, uh, winter snowstorms are bigger. Um, snowfall uh, occurs more times during the year. There's still summer in East Greenland. Um, and there still is meltwater, but summer is, uh, summer is shorter and less intense. But there is meltwater in East Greenland. You wouldn't know it from looking at these pictures, but it's there. To prove to you that it's there, I want to take you now to one more different place, which is Antarctica. Um, so my colleague um, Jan Lehnertz at the University of Colorado um, led a field team down to the Roy Baudouin ice shelf um, in Antarctica to take some, um, some climate data. They abbreviate it RBIS, um, and for a while they've been calling it the relatively boring ice shelf <laughs> because it snows there and you can measure the snow and that's about it. They don't call it that anymore. Um, So here they're using this core to uh, go down and collect layers of ice and snow um, to measure how much snowfall this ice shelf experienced um, in the recent past. And what they've gotten up is not snow that's stacked in nice, neatly countable, measurable layers, but this snow that's filled with, uh, with meltwater and slush. And their borehole is filled with water. Um, so they're not able to collect the climate data that they wanted. Um, but while they were down there, put their borehole camera down. Um, and they uncovered this subsurface lake, this end glacial aquifer, this aquifer of liquid water that exists inside their ice shelf. I think this is really cool. <laughs> and I want, uh, so how, how can this liquid water exist in Antarctica, where, I mean, Antarctica is the coldest place on Earth, um, and the mean annual temperatures here are well below zero. Um, every winter it gets, you know, minus 20 degrees Celsius, um, perhaps even colder. This water should freeze in temperatures that cold. Um, but it's that four meter thick layer of ice that sits between the glacier aquifer down here and the cold air temperatures up there that acts as an igloo, insulates that liquid water from the cold air temperatures outside, just like the igloo insulates the family and keeps the family inside warm from the cold winter. I want to tell you that there are end glacial aquifers in East Greenland, too. Um, so my colleague, Clement Miege, at the University of Utah, um, has identified all of these colored areas um, as regions where end glacial water uh, sits perched under the top 20 meters or so of the ice. Um, so in, in East Greenland here, we have a 20 meter igloo that's insulating the liquid water from the cold, southeast, from the cold East Greenland winters. Um, we can put this in diagram form here. We have this end glacial aquifer about 20 meters underneath the snow surface, and it's sitting on top of this thick ice sheet. The ice sheet here is about 1,000 meters thick, 3,000 feet. Um, so this diagram kind of exaggerates the thickness of the unglacial aquifer because um, this ice is really thick. Um, so what happens to the water in the aquifer? Um, we've, uh, we've studied this area uh, the most, uh, just upstream of Helheim Glacier here. Um, and these colored dots indicate everywhere where we see unglacial water. And you'll notice that the colored dots um, terminate just upstream of this crevasse field. And we see no end glacial water that exists um, uh, inside of this crevasse field. So the aquifer is ending just upstream of the crevasse field. Um, the aquifer is also on a slight slant. Um, so the water is not simply just sitting there um, like it would in a flat swimming pool. Um, the pool itself is actually tilted. So the water should be flowing very slowly um, from uphill 
slowly downhill towards this crevasse field. Um, so this picture is a bit grainy, um, but we can go um, to a video from the field to further study this crevasse field. Um, again, this is from um, Clem Miege at the University of Utah. Um, and this helicopter is flying downstream um, from where the fern from where the end glacial aquifer uh, terminates, um, and it's flying over the same crevasse field we saw in the image. And you can see the crevasses start out pretty thin, but as you go further and further downstream, they get thicker and thicker and wider. Um, so um, it's almost as if um, these crevasses are initiating, and then as water enters them, they get wide. And this crevasse in particular, which is the, the length of the helicopter, 10 to 15 meters wide, you can't get a crevasse that wide um, in nature without filling it with liquid water. Um, so therefore, we, um, we hypothesize that this the water in the end glacial aquifer is flowing downhill and entering these crevasses. And as it enters these crevasses, it's possible um, that they might fracture the crevasses all the way to the base of the ice sheet, a thousand meters below, and deliver this water to the base of the ice sheet. Um, are they doing so or not? Um, this is something we actually can't tell um, from the field measurements. We can measure the surface of the crevasses and see that they're very wide, but when it comes to seeing deeper down into them, um, we're just limited by the, uh, we're limited by the geometry of the crevasse. Um, so 15 meters wide at the surface, um, but if we want to see to the base of the ice sheet, that's a thousand meters down, um, and that aspect ratio is just too extreme to measure. Um, but what we can do is use numeric models to understand um, how this meltwater might be interacting with these crevasses. Um, so let me introduce you um, to the numeric model that I used um, for, to calculate the shape, size, and depth of a water-filled crevasse. Um, so a crevasse uh, is just simply a crack in the ice sheet. Um, and it has, um, it has a known shape that's based on the elastic deformation characteristics of the ice. Um, these are things that are relatively well known in material science. Um, so if you were to add just slightly more water, um, represented by this uh, magically perched <coughs> bar of liquid water on top of the crevasse, that's going to fall into the crevasse, and the extra weight of the water is going to open the crevasse um, slightly deeper to this, uh, to this dashed line. At the same time, um, the ice around the crevasse um, is, as we said, flowing under its own weight, um, gravity-driven flow. Uh, and so the flow is going to tend to close around an opening, um, and so the, the viscous or creep deformation of the ice is going to tend to, to make this crevasse go, uh, go closed. And the third thing that happens um, for, to liquid water in a crevasse um, is refreezing. So the ice around the crevasse is about negative 15 degrees Celsius, and the water is at zero degrees Celsius. So any water that's in direct contact with the cold ice sheet is going to refreeze. So these three things work together. Um, new water coming into the crevasse opens the crevasse, um, but it's competing with the tendency for the ice to viscously deform closed. And, it's, uh, and with the tendency of the water to refreeze. So this tends to drive the crevasse deeper, and these two things tend to close up the crevasse and terminate um, it on its path, to, to, to on its path downward. Um, so the question is, how much water is going into the crevasse, um, and is it enough to make this process win out against these two? Um, I personally am cheering for the aquifer water to make it to the base of the ice sheet because that's where it would get interesting. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but you don't get to cheer on your results. Uh, you don't get to choose what your results say. Um, you simply get to set up tests and run them. Um, so that's what I've done. Um, so here's the water-filled crevasse in the model. Um, and water from the glacier aquifer is going to come in um, from upstream here and flow downhill and enter the crevasse. Um, and on this main panel, um, I've exaggerated the, the dimensions of things so that you can nicely see the shape of the crevasse. Um, the true scale is over here, right? So this aquifer is 20 meters deep and the, um, the ice sheet itself is, um, is 100 meter, uh, 1,000 meters deep, uh, but you can't see the shape very well here. So with, with known flow rates in from the end glacial aquifer um, and known deformation, deformation properties um, of ice around it, we find that 
for almost every, actually for every realistic parameter set that I tested, um, the water-filled crevasse driven by the water coming in from the glacier aquifer can reach the bottom of the ice sheet. So that was cool. And now, since we have water that's reaching the base of the ice sheet here, we can ask the question, what does that mean? What is that going to do to ice flow? How is this meltwater going to interact um, with the flow of ice? Um, so I'm representing water at the base of the ice sheet um, here um, in blue. Um, and in general, um, ice that flows over um, uh, the base of the ice sheet here, uh, ice that flows over water um, moves faster. Um, if you can add new water um, to an area of the ice sheet that didn't previously have water, you're going to speed up ice flow. Um, it's kind of like, the, I like to think of it um, as sliding down a water slide. Um, so if you have been able to get the water, sli water slide nice and wet and slippery with a lot of water, you can go fast. If you've ever tried to, to <laughs> slide down a dry water slide, it's no fun. Wet water slide, much better. Um, on the other hand, if you try to add more water to the wet water slide, it may or may not make a difference in your speed. So adding more water to the base of an already wet ice sheet um, may or may not actually uh, speed up the flow of ice. If you can add water to the base of a dry ice sheet, you're definitely going to speed it up. Um, but what happens when you add water to the base of an ice sheet that's already wet? Does that speed up ice flow or not? The answer is it's complex, um, so we need another, another numeric model. Um, I want to show you next um, the model uh, that we've set up um, for the uh, water network that exists under the glacier downstream of the unglacier aquifer. Um, so we've had water on top of the ice sheet, we've had water in the middle of the ice sheet, now we have water underneath the ice sheet, um, and this is where it gets really interesting for ice flow. Um, so uh, this map over here um, just illustrates uh, the area uh, that we're working in. So here's where the end glacial aquifer is, this, uh, this pinkish purple area. Um, and we have um, the aquifer water entering crevasses just um, here, just upstream of this 40 kilometer mark. Um, the ice itself is flowing downhill, um, down into this outlet glacier um, called Helheim in East Greenland, um, Helheim Glacier. Um, and so too is the water at the base of the ice sheet. So water is going to punch through the ice sheet here at 40 kilometers, make it to the base of the ice sheet through that crevasse, and then it's going to, uh, to make its way underneath the glacier, lubricating ice flow um, to the ocean. The model results um, are here. So the colors are showing how much water is in each area. Um, and these, uh, these panels um, just exactly match um, to the map. Um, so this is the farthest, uh, the farthest uphill on the glacier, and as you travel downhill, you eventually reach the ocean. Um, the colors, um, blue has less water, yellows and reds have a lot of water. Um, and you'll notice this fringe on the bottom. Um, <coughs> excuse me. Um, the black and gray lines show where water has organized itself into channels. So just as we saw um, river channels on the surface of the ice sheet, water organizes itself into these channels. Um, this happens at the base of the ice sheet, too. Um, so let's, uh, oh yeah, and the, the difference between the two panels, um, in this case, uh, we are adding water from the aquifer um, into the glacier here at 40 kilometers. Um, in this case, we are not adding that water. So a control case on the left and the case that we're testing on the right. Um, so the model proceeds through the melt season. Um, all, of these, um, all, of the, uh, all of the water comes in at the lower glacier, um, and all these complex patterns emerge. So you see this red bar up here. This is in our model where we're, we're indicating that we're putting water in from the unglacial aquifer. And you see the red water, um, it's, it's going a bit fast, so sorry about that. Um, you see the red water um, travel quickly down um, and get explored at the bottom of the glacier. Um, but as it's doing that, um, it forms these channels. 
Uh, so here these channels are forming. Um, and what the channels do, um, they suck water into themselves. Uh, so the channels set up this low pressure environment underneath the glacier. Um, and uh, since it's low pressure, it has suction, um, and it sucks water from the surrounding area um, into the channels, which grows the channels larger, which actually reduces the pressure again, and so there's this virtuous cycle of that once a channel is formed, it can keep sucking water, sucking water, sucking water into it. Um, so you can have areas of the ice sheet that started out wet with a lot of water in them um, that this channelized system now um, tends to dry them out. So even though we're putting in a bunch of water um, into, the out, into the glacier from the unglacial aquifer, um, the subglacial water network system is acting to counteract that. Um, so it's the stabilizing force that exists in nature. Um, and I want to illustrate just what exactly this subglacial channel network looks like um, in real life. Um, so this outlet glacier in western Greenland um, is actually, so this is, this is looking under the ice sheet, right? This is if you were to suddenly peel off all of the ice that's on top of Greenland um, and, see, and see the rock underneath it, this is the path that water would take um, through Greenland. So it looks a lot like the water network on the surface. Um, it's dendritic. It has these small tributaries that, uh, that flow into these larger channels. Um, so these larger channels are sucking water out um, from, from these more isolated areas and funneling the water into these channels that exports it quickly to the ocean. Um, so the effect on ice flow is complex. Um, so areas, of the areas underneath the ice sheet that were once well watered and very well lubricated and sliding along quite well um, can change throughout, throughout the year. Um, they can become less well lubricated and so the ice speeds up and slows down through the course of the year um, in really interesting ways. Um, so this glacier, Helheim Glacier, which we saw on the map um, in this beautiful photo um, from a uh, NASA airplane, um, there's no water visible on the surface, but the water is under there. Um, it's 20 meters below the ice sheet surface here in the glacial aquifer, and it's also at the base of the ice sheet where it's interacting in complex ways uh, with ice flow. So all of this comes together for ice sheet mass balance. Um, we have satellite measurements going back um, to 2004. We have a uh, 15-year history of measuring the mass of the Greenland ice sheet um, every year. In the winter, it grows bigger because there's more snow. In the summer, it grows smaller because it melts. Um, so we can see the seasonal, the seasonal um, fluctuations of the ice sheet as it breathes in and breathes out and breathes in and breathes out. Um, it's exporting water, it's exporting mass through water, um, through water melting and through ice flow. Um, but of course we can also see that the ice sheet is massively out of balance. Um, it's growing uh, on top of this seasonal cycle is superimposed this steep downward trend. Um, so since the time series began, um, the ice has lost, the, the mass of the Greenland ice sheet um, has decreased by about a thousand or about one thousandth of its mass um, just in 10 years. Um, so this is information that we now have um, from, um, from Earth orbiting satellites. Um, the way that this was constructed um, was by measuring the gravity around the Greenland ice sheet. So there are two satellites um, that fly in orbit um, and they follow one another and they know their positions very, very precisely. Um, by two lasers that are constantly um, communicating between the, two between the two satellites. And as the first satellite um, goes over a big landmass, um, such as Greenland um, or Tibetan Plateau, anything in, anything in the Earth that has more mass and therefore more gravity, it speeds up. And so the distance between the two satellites gets longer. Um, and so by, measuring, by continually measuring the distance between the two satellites, we can construct um, how much gravity is in each area. And so as, as the Greenland ice sheet shrinks and melts, we can see its gravity reducing and we can construct these curves. So let's return finally to Western Greenland again, uh, where we have these beautiful visible meltwater rivers. We can see the water flowing around 
It's a very visible reminder of the climate change that's occurring and the sea level rise that Greenland is holding and bringing and delivering every summer. Um, but I want to remind you, so this is just part of the story, the surface meltwater, because there's also water buried inside the glacier in these large glacial aquifers and underneath the glacier um, that helps it contribute, that, that if in ways that affect its flow to the ocean. Um, so with that, I'll close. And I'd love to take any of your questions. Yeah, uh, we have microphones coming around, so. Has anyone ever attempted to scuba dive in the under, <laughs> under, in the aquifers underneath, or the rivers? No, not to my knowledge. <laughs> um, you know, it's it's not going to be long, though. I mean, um, there's all sorts of mountaineers who are after, you know, these incredible climbs. Um, these r So these rivers erode these, like, large canyons, um, which I haven't shown, but ca canyon walls that go down, you know, 30 meters, 50 meters, um, and people are rappelling down them and, you know, descending into these, like, tiny shafts. Um, yeah. <laughs> I don't know when it will happen, but um, yeah, there's, there's going to be someone who finds a way to, to put themselves um, inside these grottos and go exploring. Yeah, you go ahead and pick Lori. <laughs> Hi, thank you. Excellent talk. Um, for the soot and the ash that you mentioned, um, does the rate of melting, is it affected by the composition? For example, you know, if you sample it and there's more ash or more whatever in it? Yeah, um, it probably is. <laughs> uh, I, I don't know, I don't really know the details of, like, how each individual substance is in that cryokinite dust, um, uh, how that affects uh, the sunlight. But, yeah, different materials are going to absorb differently um, and probably, uh, and probably uh, sink in at different rates. Um, yeah, and there's going to be all sorts of local variations of the composition, too, because um, some of the soot comes in that's windblown directly from a forest fire that happened, you know, say, last week. Um, but some of that soot um, followed the, that particle path um, through the ice sheet, and so it emerges, you know, tens of thousands of years later. Um, and so that's obviously going to have a very different chemical composition since it's from such an old, different time. Um, so that's an interesting question. Yeah. Yeah, I can repeat the question. Um, from an engineering point of view, um, is the Greenland ice sheet system unstable and is it running away? Um, too close, too too soon to tell. I mean, there, there's there's a lot of there's a lot of feedbacks that are that are in motion here, um, and although we have a lot of data, um, we really only have data over the past you know since the satellite era uh, is when our good coverage starts. Uh, so with only you know, 30 years of, of, of data, um, it's too soon to say. Are the, um, in glacial aquifers, is that anything new or is there data to suggest how long they've been there? Are they growing? Yeah, great question. Um, so they've only been discovered, um, in 2011. Um, so we have only known about them for, you know, seven years. Um, the question of how long have they been there, um, they're relatively new, um, although the jury's, uh, th this, is, this is new research. Um, so they have looked at, um, I believe it's the, it's the content of CFCs in the water. It's some atmospheric gas that they've picked up. Um, I don't remember the chemistry of it. Um, but they can tell from it's either the lifetime of that gas, so maybe it's carbon-14, um, or the, the historical concentrations of CFCs versus time, um, that this water in the one local area which I know of 
These, these aquifers have only started forming since the 1980s. Yeah. Um, and they are growing and they are expanding further inland. Um, as, as temperatures warm um, and melt is happening further inland, these aquifers are also expanding further inland. Yeah. So um, another thing, you know, the jury's out on, you know, what do they do next and do they continue to change and, and how far do they grow? So, so um, is it known what the relative importance of melting versus physical ice movement is for getting, delivering water to the ocean? Yes, um, it is, and it, it changes over time. Um, so uh, up until about 2004, um, the ice flow was bringing more than half of the, uh, of the ice to Ice flow was accounting for more than half of the mass imbalance, um, and ice melt was accounting for you know 40 percent or so. In 2004, it switched, um, and ice melt started to take over. Um, and it's not that the ice was slowing down; the ice is, you know, if anything, it's it's accelerating. The ice flow is 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 still increasing um, in general year after year, um, but the ice melt is increasing faster. Um, so today, um, ice melt is the dominant contributor. Um, from Greenland to, to sea levels. But they are close. Um, you wouldn't be wrong if you said they were roughly 50-50. So that's what I often say. <laughs> As the uh, ice melts, does the, I would think the concentration of soot would get more and more, and how, would, how does that affect further melting? Yeah, absolutely. Um, as more ice melts, um, yeah, more, more soot particles are coming up and, 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 and staying there. Um, I think it saturates at a certain point. Um, so like, uh, I could click back to the, to the image. Um, the Krakenite is quite dark already. Um, and I don't know, uh, I don't know its exact albedo if it's, you know, if it's absorbing almost all the sunlight um, or if it's still got a ways to go, I'm not sure. Um, but my best guess would be that it's, uh, it's already pretty close to saturated. The thing is, the Krakenite sort of collects in uh, very specific areas, um, particularly where, um, where ice from the last ice age um, is melting out. Um, the last ice age, um, Earth was different. Um, Earth was dustier. Uh, so, um, so snow that fell and turned into ice in the last ice age um, has got a lot more Krakenite in it. Um, and so you, you have these bands um, across, across the ice in western Greenland where you can see the Ice Age ice coming out. Um, it's pretty cool. You can see it on Google Earth. It's, um, it's worth taking a tour for yourself. Um, so this is something that, yeah, and, and as, as, the ice, as the ice melts more, we're going to see more and more of these. Um, yeah, great question. Yeah, so um, under the, uh, the question is, um, when water is put under great weights, um, the freezing point gets depressed. So water can be liquid at colder temperatures than normal. Um, yeah, uh, it's true, uh, and we account for this. Um, so under the base of the Greenland ice sheet, for instance, where our model was working, um, under 1,000 meters of ice, that's really heavy. Um, and so that pressure helps water to stay liquid um, at colder temperatures. Um, it depresses the freezing point by a couple degrees Celsius. Yeah, so it makes a difference. Something you have to account for um, when, you, when you think about these things. In the aquifers, either in Antarctica or Greenland, have the microorganisms there been studied? Not to my knowledge. Um, and Water samples can be brought up? They can, yeah. Um, and it would be, so the, yeah, it would be an interesting place for a microorganism to live um, because it's completely blocked off from sunlight. Um, yeah, under 20 meters of ice, um, you're not getting any, um, any energy from the sun. Um, there are extremophiles lots of places. Um, to my knowledge, they haven't been discovered in these aquifers 
and I've got to assume that they've been looked for because as you point out, you, you know, it's fairly easy to take water samples. Um, but I haven't heard of any news of, dis of any discoveries of living things in the aquifers. I think, yes, exactly. I think they could be actually bodies of water without living organisms. Um, I can add to that that um, the helicopter pilots that fly us around in western Greenland, fly us to our field sites, um, they often come with, uh, with carboys, with five-gallon jugs um, to fill with glacier meltwater to take it back to town um, because it's such pure, delicious water. Um, they make their coffee with it, which kind of always seemed odd to me, like I would just want to drink the water. <laughs> um, but yeah, but there's some local knowledge uh, for the, the purity of the glacial meltwater. Um, this may be a little off topic, but and maybe it's a little related to the last question, but it's, it surprised me that you said there aren't any polar bears seems like they'd be able to migrate across the northern hemisphere and at least on the edge of Greenland you'd have seals or something like that which would serve as food so how do you what's the explanation for that um, I believe there are um, yeah there are polar bear sightings um, perhaps even small polar bear populations along the coast of Greenland um, the ice sheet is is really tall and really large um, and it's so you know it it takes humans a lot of effort to get up onto it, um, and it would also take a polar bear a lot of effort to, you know, go exploring. Um, and it must be that over time, the, you know, polar bears have learned that uh, when you go up onto the ice sheet, you don't find anything worthwhile. And so, I, th yeah, so they really don't expend the energy um, to go up onto the ice sheet itself. Um, yeah, I imagine there's, uh, there must be things for them along the coast, um, so you would see them there. When you read about the ultimate effects of this, you hear stories, prediction of the Gulf Stream reversing, of the St. Lawrence Seaway turning around, with the climate up here becoming much cooler, and of course the water level rising, getting back to your original pictures of Manhattan. Can you discuss that a bit and how long it may be till we really see that? <laughs> it's unlikely that the Gulf Stream will ever reverse. Um, extremely unlikely. Um, physically very difficult to get that to happen. Um, there is some evidence that the Gulf Stream has slowed down or even very nearly turned off in very pa in, in tens of in ten ten thousand years ago, um, ten to fifteen thousand years ago. There's some evidence that that a slowdown or a stoppage occurred. Um, it can't run backwards, so we don't have to worry about that. Um, but uh, yeah, certainly, um, certainly the interaction between meltwater uh, from Greenland and the ocean um, is something that we need to consider um, and that is being considered um, as we think about future climates. So maybe two more questions. Thank you. Um, who put the satellites up there, and is there any chance that Donald Trump will make them take them down? <laughs> 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 um, I showed data from a number of different satellites, um, some of which are operated by NASA. Um, in partnership with the USGS, the United States Geological Survey. Um, many of the satellites um, are in partnership with other countries um, or entirely run by other countries, uh, Canada, Germany. Um. Oh, Grace, yeah, the gravity satellites. Um, <laughs> okay, to directly answer your question, once a satellite is up there, it's up there. Um, it's, you know, uh, it's just not worth taking it down. It's, you know, expensive. Um, <laughs> excuse me, um, the gravity, the gravity satellites, um, have actually stopped working. Um, they worked for, I think they're, 
they did great. They worked for way longer than they were supposed to. Um, and I'm not sure of the numbers, but um, I th often satellites are given three years for their expectation. And Grace, as you saw, the gravity satellites have been up for, for 15. Um, they're now kaput um, as of about three months ago. Um, it looks good that the follow-on mission will go up. And, and, and it's just you know, clones of these same satellites. So it's relatively, well, it's never easy to build a satellite, um, but, uh, but it looks like they're going back up. <laughs> would, you, would you please tell, tell us about uh, the funding for your research, uh, the sources for your research and whether that pool of monies for you and others is decreasing or in trouble in terms of the types of research that you have been doing or want to do? Um, if I told you that, uh, so my funding primarily comes from NASA, um, also National Science Foundation. Um, if I told you that everyone in my community was uh, putting a smile on their face and going about their business not too worried about the future, um, that would be false. Uh, <laughs> but um, it's, it's pretty murky. Yeah, it's pretty murky right now. Um, yeah, I'm sorry, I don't have a better answer. Um, but yeah, that's the reality is um, it's uncertain times. Um, and not just for scientists, right, for, um, for everyone. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think that's a, as good a place to end. Um, <laughs> thank you, Kirsten.